Okay, great. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to our monthly WFO webinar. My name is Aidia Karnaluchov and I'm the Senior Development Manager at WFO. Uh, today, uh, today's webinar is on offshore wind technology updates and it's my great pleasure to welcome our three excellent speakers for today. We have Chiaki Matoka from Tokyo Marine. We have Paul McEvoy, Chief Technology Officer from uh, TFI Marine. And we have Will Rowley, CEO at Offshore Solution Group. And before we jump into, into our presentations for today, let me tell you a few things about WFO. The organization was founded in 2018, and we're a nonprofit entity focused exclusively on offshore wind. We do promote offshore wind, and our members represent the complete offshore wind value chain. We have offices in, in, uh, in Hamburg, Tokyo, Taipei, and New York. And in terms of our activities, it's very straightforward as we focus on three things. We lobby for offshore wind, we inform about offshore wind, and we connect the global offshore wind community. We have at the moment over 80 members that represent the, the complete offshore wind value chain. And we have members from North America, Europe, Asia, and even uh, Oceania, Australia. If you're not a member of WFO yet, please make sure to join us. And if you would like to have more information, go to our website, contact Duna Hersik, our managing director. And uh, now a few things about the structure of the webinar, which is very simple. During the first part of the webinar, our three excellent speakers provide their presentations. And then in the remaining time, we do have Q&A session. And without any further ado, Paul, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining. And uh, good afternoon from Ireland, or, or good evening or good morning, depending on the part of the world you're in. Um, I want to talk today a little about uh, mooring compliance control and give you a technology update on a solution we're offering in this space. Um, so first of all, just, just to make sure we're all in the some sort of same page, um, mooring of floating wind is, is different from other mooring systems and that the primary difference is, is, is actually due to that wind thrust. The, the secondary difference is about size of platforms and so on, but the primary difference is the fact that you're trying to moor a platform that has a very high thrust load on that platform attempting to sail it across the ocean. Uh, and this, this just causes challenges because traditional mooring systems haven't been designed for this. Uh, and compliance is a, is a key requirement here, making the mooring system behave the way you want it to behave. And all compliance is, is an indication of the restoring force of that mooring system uh, based on how far off, off the original uh, location the platform has moved. Uh, so the problem with existing sort of mooring systems for floating offshore wind is generally they have a very stiff compliance around the thrust load of the turbine. And what that means is, is wave-induced motions or wind-induced motions uh, for variable winds uh, at those sort of thrust loads result in very high variations in the peak loads and, and the variable loads seen by that mooring system. And that results in very high costs. So, so what other mooring systems are out there that we can try to use? Well, there, there's your typical mass or buoyancy response mooring system. So catenary chain is a, is a classic example from this. Uh, and the size and the weight of that chain sort of determines the overall response, but it responds in a catenary sort of response curve. Uh, you can modify this by, by using various clump weights or floats within your mooring system. And again, a lot of mooring system designers do this to try to optimize and achieve the mooring system response that they want within their platform. Another good approach is material response, where you use a material in your mooring system, a uh, synthetic rope, fiber, for example, uh, to give a particular desired response within that system. Uh, and typical approaches or materials being looked at would include your, your polyesters and your nylons in terms of responsive fibers, but you'll also have the opposite uh, end of the system. So fibers that have very little response, uh, for example, a, a Dyneema fiber, or even a, a wire rope system, again, that has very, very little response within the system. One of the challenges, however, with, with the fiber ropes is getting the elongation you want with the sh very, very high number of uh, variable loads that are within that system, and keeping that fatigue life of that component uh, within the design life you need, which could be 25 years plus for the platform. So mooring in FOWT to date has been very, very broad. There's been a very wide range of solutions that, that have been used and tried and are being proposed. Uh, everything from catenary system to fiber rope systems, systems with uh, floating clump weights, systems with uh, distributed clump weights, systems with floats, 
uh, and every single possible uh, synthetic fiber option also being looked at at the moment. So what I want to introduce today for the technology update is, is the C-Spring. So what the C-Spring is, is a polymer uh, component sitting on a metal structure, which converts the tension in the mooring line to a compression on the polymer component. So it's a component that's designed to be, to be smarter in that allows you to choose where you want the compliance in the mooring system. So by tailoring the shape of the polymer, uh, we can choose how it responds at various elongations. And it, it is a piece of jewelry. It could work with any mooring system. Um, and it's down to the mooring system designer to choose what C-spring component they want, what response they want within that component, uh, and how to put it into their mooring system. So an example of what C-springs look like, uh, well, uh, the, the page here just has a couple of examples. So on the left-hand side, we, we have a C-spring designed for a 2.5 meganewton MBL load, um, and that's going on to a, a floating wind platform later this year, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and on the left-hand side, we have a lot of our aquaculture components. So these are smaller sea springs designed for about 400, 500 uh, kilonewton MBLs, but specifically designed for letting you move aquaculture cages to more exposed environments without having to change the, the cages themselves. Uh, and in the bottom right-hand corner, you see some fatigue testing, uh, and bottom left and in the center, we see some uh, certification work we were doing up at the European Marine Energy Center up in Orkney. So as I said earlier, the polymer shape that defines the compliance curve. And on the right hand side, you see an example of the sort of compliance curves that we can deliver with different shaped polymers. So we can deliver a component that behaves like a catenary mooring line, or we can deliver a component that delivers a linear response, or we can deliver components that deliver digressive responses, so that are stiffer initially and become more compliant the more they extend. Uh, so typically also, our polymer mooring springs would have greater than 50% elongation. So again, they're, they're further elongation and more compliant themselves than say a fiber rope would typically be. So to give an example of that, on the top here, I have a slice image of one of our springs cut down the middle and we just see the outer upper diameter of it. And if I run that simulation, you can see how as it's compressed, so the metalwork extension of the mooring line compresses this polymer and you see how the shape changes as it compresses. And the design of that shape is what gives us a particular mooring system response. And that component matches the response which we have shown below uh, in, in the graph there. So the size of the polymer then determines the overall stiffness. So if we increase the diameter of the polymer and scale all of the other factors, such as the thickness of the polymer up, uh, we just increase the overall stiffness of the exact same response curve. Uh, and then the amount of elongation you want in a mooring system is just taken by the overall length of spring you want in the system. So if you want 10 meters of elongation at a, a particular load, then you, you choose a, a long enough length of spring. So the particular elongation you want that load at uh, gives you 10 meters uh, elongation. Uh, so it's very simple for a mooring system designer to choose the response they want, to choose the stiffness they want, and to choose the amount of spring they need or the number of individual springs they need to deliver the overall behavior they want within their mooring system. So what do these look like in mooring systems? Well, here on the left is an image of a principal power platform showing our three uh, mooring springs within that mooring line up towards near the top of the platform in a uh, um, catenary um, uh, uh, um, alignment in this case. Uh, and the type of response we use in a floating offshore wind application is what we call a digressive response. So we find a response that's very stiff, so very little compliance um, initially, but around the target load, the thrust load that you see in the turbines or that the turbines are causing the mooring load, uh, lines, we have a very high level of compliance. And what this means is now the same wave-induced motion results in a much smaller variation in the loads within the mooring system, reducing the overall design loads for every component within that mooring system but also reducing the variable loads and therefore the fatigue within that mooring system. And when we look at all of the benefits this has, uh, both in terms of the reduction in MDL in all components, the smaller components re resulting in much smaller uh, installation vessel requirements or deck layouts, uh, the lower MBLs and, and loads resulting in smaller bollard poles, uh, the, the reduction in, in operational maintenance due to lower fatigue or the lifetime extensions due to that lower fatigue, 
it can result in a very substantial change in the overall LCOE of an entire project. So how do we demonstrate that we're ready for market? Well, later this year, we're going to be putting our mooring springs on the Unitech as a virus platform up in, uh, I should probably say, Kamoi in uh, Norway. Um, and that's going to be in core four 2022. And we're going to insert our sea springs into the existing mooring lines, removing the clump weights that are currently in those lines. And we're going to demonstrate about a 30% uh, reduction in the peak loads within that system with no change to the uh, watt circle or with no change to the pitch behavior of the platform. Now, I mentioned compliance of the post to load reduction here because for many customers, uh, it's actually other aspects of compliance that are important for them. So one of the things we will demonstrate is about six months into our project, we will change the tension in the system to demonstrate that because we have a very compliant response around the thrust load, we can give up some of that load reduction in return for reducing the surge. And in this case, we're going to demonstrate about a five meter reduction in surge, uh, giving up maybe about 5% of our load reduction. And that can result in much higher cost benefits because of course this will impact on the umbilical lines as well, allowing people to move to uh, less motion in the umbilical lines, less force, less fatigue, uh, and reduce the cost of those instead. So where are we? Well, we're currently going through our certification of the product for deployment in Norway later this year. So this is part of our full-scale component certification work with DNV. Um, DNV issued our, our initial statement of feasibility back in 2019. We've been working through the um, qualification plan since then. We're now writing up all of the, the reporting from that, but we've completed all of the experimental and test work and design work required as part of that. Uh, and we intend to have our certification complete on the fabrication of our components for our demonstration later this year. So we will have certified components to offer to the market by the end of this year. Uh, in terms of where we are in terms of scale and product timeline, well, we can deliver three megawatt scale components now. Uh, and we're currently starting the fabrication or the build of our new factory, which will enable us to deliver 15 megawatt scale plus components ready for delivery into the market by late 2023. And that's what I'm going to say. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'll pass on to the next presenter. And uh, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Chiaki Motoka. So um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chiaki Motoka. I am in the offshore energy and renewable offshore team, wind team in Tokyo Marine Nichiro Fire Insurance Company. Um, I will, um, taking this opportunity, I would like to thank World Forum Osho Wind for inviting me as a speaker today. And I am looking forward to the discussion throughout this webinar. Um, so today's agenda, uh, first I would like to introduce about Tokyo Marine Group, and then I will go over briefly the current status of the um, Japanese offshore wind market, and then I would like to share what Tokyo Marine provides, uh, mainly for the offshore wind market in Japan. And lastly, I would like to go into the summary. Um, so firstly, um, how where this slides come in. Um, so firstly, to introduce the Tokyo Marine Group, um, Tokyo Marine was a first insurance company in Japan, founded in 1879. Um, now, Tokyo Marine Holding is established and are a big group now, operating in domestic and international market, which is Japan, and 46 other countries, regions worldwide. In respect of numbers, um, our top line is about 42 billion US dollars, um, and adjusted net income about 30, uh, 3.9 billion US dollars. And we are proud of having high rating from third party rating institution, uh, for example, A plus by SMP and A double plus by AM Best. Okay, here. Um, so um, Tokyo Marine's key strength is um, business portfolio management. Uh, for portfolio op optimization, we have been balancing um, business diversification and um, growth through uh, forward looking MA over the years. We can see from the slide that from year 2000, um, Tokyo Marine has been expanding into international businesses. Uh, from the offshore energy and offshore wind perspective, I would like to pick up the acquisition of Killen in 2008 and ACC in 2015. As a result of our, as a result, our composition of profits is um, nearly 50-50 um, between international and domestic businesses. Uh, from the previous slides, we can see that Tokyo Marine is uh, a big family, but in respect of offshore wind, the main subsidiary um, involved is Tokyo Marine Digital Fire, in short TMNF, uh, for the Japanese businesses, and HCC as G-Cube um, for international business, and Tokyo Marine DR, in short TDR, 
um, as our risk consulting and risk engineering company. At this timing, I would like to touch on the acquisition of G-Cube as this is very important element of Tokyo Marine's renewable business. Um, G-Cube was an MGA, well, saying it's simple, an underwriting agent for renewable energy business. And in year 2020, um, the company was acquired by ACC, now becoming a member of Tokyo Marine Group. Um, GQ has underwritten over 70 projects, uh, 70 offshore wind projects worldwide, and needless to say, their expertise from that experience um, is very um, highly respected and valued by the market. Um, TMNF and GQ operates as a different entity, uh, but we have good communication and collaboration within the group. Uh, we exchange our each other's experiences and knowledge, so we, um, this is empowering the Tokyo Marine Group. So now about TMNF, uh, where I am in. Uh, TMNF writes over 50 offshore wind projects worldwide now. Uh, we started writing offshore wind in year 2013. We started from the European project, which Japanese company had involvement in. And through that process, we have been uh, started to be recognized as a proper offshore wind underwriter. So that status brought us opportunities to write non-Japanese projects as well. Um, so this boosted our expertise and knowledge in this area. Looking at the other areas, uh, we write U.S. projects too, and in respect of Taiwanese projects, we write them all, as we believe the Taiwanese projects can have similar character characteristics with our main market, Japan, um, such as net risks. And in Japan, we have a demo project, and we are proud that we have been chosen as a lead insurance company for the first and the second commercial project. Um, so this enabled us to take hands with the project owners and go through experiences in the early stages of the industry. So that's all for Tokyo Marine's introduction. Now I would like to move on to the current state of the Japanese offshore wind market. Um, so for uh, Japanese offshore wind market uh, project, I believe there are three categories. Um, the one is demonstration projects. Um, two is the project that that are authorized by the prefectural government, which is mostly the ports and harbor projects. And third is the projects that are um, authorized by the Japanese government, which is in the general sea. Um, this slide shows how the port and harbor project is. And as the law for the usage of the port area was organized earlier, um, these projects are run, running earlier than the general sea project, and the developer is already selected for these areas. So the first um, commercial project, Akita Noshiro, led by Marweni Consortium, is now under construction, aiming to start operation end of this year. Um, it was in the news the other day that pre-assembly of the tower started in April, um, and together with the blade, it will be installed in mid-June. Um, the new Ishikari Bay port led by GPI Consortium and Kita Kyushu port led by Kyuden Mira Energy, J, J Power Consortium, and the Kashima port led by Tokyo Gas, Bina Energy, Wind Power um, Consortium is preparing for FID and construction now. Um, in respect of the general sea areas, as mentioned, uh, this is authorized by the Japanese government. The area promoted as promotion areas, uh, which is um, the red ones, are agreed for auction and so the first one, the Goto's developer was awarded to Toda Corporation, uh, Consortium in June 2021. Um, that's uh, Noshiro Mitane Oga, Yuri Honjo Choshi, uh, was awarded to Mitsubishi Corporation and its consortium members in December 2021. Um, and the fifth one, Hapo no Town in Noshiro City, this um, auction was launched in, launched in December 2021. Uh, this is paused now uh, to set up a better auction rules by the government. So we, the market is now waiting for the new rules to come out. On this slide, um, I would like to point out what we think is the Japanese specific characteristic, characteristics and risks. Um, I prepared three points, and the first is which I think is everybody um, else brings it as the first point too. Um, but they, we have to consider the impact of nat ca uh, natural catastrophe projects in Japan. But I would like to point out the tendency and the characteristics of the NACA differs per each area. So there are areas that are more, um, that has more exp uh, exposures for earthquake and less typhoon exposures but, um, the, than the other areas. And there are areas that are vice versa. So we should put in mind that what kind of exposure that specific area has uh, when look, looking into what kind of NACA exposure the project actually has. And the second point is the um, experience of the contractor for offshore works. Um, as there are a few, well, um, close to none, 
um, oil gas field in Japan. There were no major offshore construction historically. Uh, from the same reason, there were no project that has complexity, uh, multiple contractors involved in one project offshore. Um, however, um, we are proud to say that there are construction and marine construction companies who are experienced in ports, harbor, and offshore airport construction. Um, of course, we have a mature industry for the onshore wind. Um, also, also, we have cable suppliers, contractors, experience in telecom cable and interla interland cables. Um, so we believe that the potential Japan has is very reliable. And last point about the supply chain. Uh, Japan is still on the course of de development, um, which leads to longer lead time and long, longer downtime when any replacement is required. And this can be crucial for the project side, of course, and also from insurance perspective, the delay in startup or business interruption insurance can um, become larger. So we have to carefully look into how the loss can occur. But Japan um, has a top level manufacturing industry, which will def definitely help the establishment of the supply chain. And we have a reputable shipping industry that will help the industry uh, from the floating off offshore wind aspect as well. Um, so I have went over the current status and what we think that are key risks of the Japanese market. And now we would like to show what Tokyo Marine provides to the market. Um, as TMNF, we underwrite the risks, which means we um, act as insurers for the project. And second, um, we try to provide and share the knowledge and experiences through our underwriting. Uh, from the prior project so that our clients will be prepared and aware for the next project and insurance placement that they have to go through. Um, for, from the third point, um, this is what the TD, what TDR provides. Um, TDR is a risk consulting, risk engineering arm of the Tokyo Marine Group. So um, for our showman business, they provide EML, PML calculation, which I will um, touch upon later and risk advisory, insurance advisory services for clients going into auction competitions and also actual insurance placement. Uh, we believe we are able to provide a comprehensive support and service to our clients and would like to contribute, their, contribute to their um, success in their important business. Um, from the pre previous slide, I would like to um, especially share about the EML, PML calculation service we provide. Uh, most of the offshore wind project which has uh, capacity to a certain extent, um, it is uh, important to evaluate the estimate, estimated maximum loss. Um, this will be used to set the insurance limit they purchase. Um, as it may be thought safe and comfortable to purchase the insurance up to 100% of the uh, project value, um, this means that insurance premium will charge for that 100%. And if there is a certain, um, if the capacity of the project is very huge, um, the insurance capacity in that market uh, may not be enough for that 100%. Um, so as a whole, it is economical to purchase insurance um, to a maximum loss amount um, calculated on the founded approach. Um, email, EML on the left side of this slide, um, this is a method using a scenario approach. Um, for example, most of the European projects, project project's uh, maximum loss scenario is um, thought to be total loss of the sub offshore substation. Um, and we think that uh, as, it, as it is important to calculate the maximum loss am amount from EML approach, um, in areas which are exposed to NAPCAT, um, it is important to evaluate the loss from that aspect as well. Um, TDR has established a model that can calculate the loss amount after installation and occurred by earthquake with return period of 475 years and typhoon with return period of 100 years. And this enables to persuade the lenders that insurance limit they should buy, the project owners should buy, and also to purely understand exposure of the project has. And we believe this is an, an important process to go through for projects which are in uh, which are planned and um, go under Japan. So they, um, these slides, excuse me, uh, so this side um, shows very simply how the calculation is made for PML. Uh, first, you go to the um, exposure module and to understand the exposure of the structure itself, such as location, amount, uh, what kind of structure it is, and then going through hazard module and vulnerability, fragility module, um, we finally go into the loss and risk module 
um, calculating the loss amount by creating this kind of um, risk curve um, on the right hand side. Um, yeah, on the right hand side. Uh, for this is um, a process for the EQ earthquake, but um, we go through a similar process for the typhoon as well. So in summary, um, well, we think that uh, well, well, this is a fact. Um, Japanese offshore wind market is growing, uh, is in the growing stage. Um, ports and harbor projects are under constructions or either um, preparing for FID construction. And general sea areas, um, the initial project award was awarded, and there will be more to come. Um, and I have went through the specific Jan Japanese characteristics, such as NATCAD, um, experience of contractors, and developed supply chain. And then uh, we have talked about the developer uh, talk that explained that the developers shall, uh, the project owners shall evaluate their NATCAD exposures, which um, lenders is ca um, cautious to. Um, and they are required with uh, many explanations and uh, to understand the NACA exposure the project has. Um, and yes. So um, we, Tokyo Marine, are capable of supporting um, all, all kinds of, um, kind of aspects in this offshore wind uh, project in Japan. So um, please feel free, to come, feel free to come to Tokyo Marine, um, Tokyo Marine DR, for Japanese offshore wind risks and insurance support. Thank you for listening. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our uh, next uh, speaker, Will Rowley. Will? Just while we give Ilya a minute to sort out the technical challenges. Uh, great couple of presentations from my co-presenters. And one of the things I'm going to hopefully do is tie together the two different aspects you've seen in terms of technology uh, and risk. So while we do that, I'll introduce myself and that will save on a, on a couple of slides. So I'm Will Rowley, I run Offshore Solutions Group. For those of you who haven't heard of us, uh, we're a couple of years old now. Um, we're a relatively small team and we focus on deliverability of floating wind. Uh, so our team include XCTO, Principal Power, uh, uh, Innovation Lead from Subsea 7 and various other technical uh, and specialist. I'm a market specialist myself by background. Uh, our average experience is hovering around about 27 years, which means we have our fair share of gray hair between us. But we work very closely with developers and key supply chain companies and look very closely at how to deliver some of these projects from demonstrators through commercial uh, and increasingly into uh, full markets development. So I only have a small number of slides. Uh, there is a, a wider slide pack that will come afterwards. Um, but as I say, just to reiterate, so we're a relatively small team, uh, a couple of years old, but with some real technical and commercial expertise between us. And some examples of typical work we're on at the moment because of where most of the flow projects are in the development timeline. We're looking very closely at logistics. We're looking at deliverability. Um, we're looking at temporary mooring. We're looking at wet storage. We're looking at fabrication, joint fabrication, split fabrication, uh, as well as heavily involved in, in the moorings, in anchoring. Uh, as I said, for demonstration projects, commercial projects, uh, and that's right around the world. So we're looking at projects across the UK, across France, uh, across uh, Korea, uh, Australia, uh, the US. Uh, next slide, please, Ilya. We're not a technology company directly, um, but the key thing that we do with our work with developers and key supply chain companies is we're heavily involved in the deployment of the solutions that include the technology. So what I wanted to do today to link together the two previous presentations and lead into a discussion is just talk about some of the common practical challenges that we see from the work that we do. Uh, so. It's quite a long list, but I've tried to summarize it into, into four Ds, as you see them on the screen. Uh, and this applies to a lot of technology, even so-called established technology that's been transferred either from oil and gas or from marine operations, uh, because the same challenge goes through whether it's so-called established but being reapplied or whether it's new as in completely new. So 
a common challenge we get is around deliverability. Um, and this is particularly when we start to think about deliverability at scale. So this is less of an issue for demonstration projects. Uh, it's an, an issue for some of the commercial projects. Um, and now we know the definitions vary, but commercial really meaning 10 to 20 type units, whereas full scale uh, gigawatt is beyond 20 heading towards 50, 100 type units, uh, and possibly more if in multiple phases. So the availability and can the equipment, can the technology be delivered at scale on time in the current supply chain environment? That is a key deliverability question that we go through time and time again. And particularly for relatively small technology, I mean small not in terms of its physical amount, but stuff that's not been deployed on scale. And that even applies to dealing with um, permanent moorings from oil and gas, where the scale is usually much smaller, uh, individual projects. So we do have some issues around scale up. Uh, there was a wide discussion this morning uh, um, in one of the, um, the subcommittees. It's a constant process to reevaluate what supply is. But the challenge for us when it comes to technology is how do you apply that into a, into a project to provide a comfort and a confidence that it can be delivered when you start to scale up? Because part of the challenge on the commercial projects in theory, it's the same on the demonstration, but certainly on the commercial projects, is to create a template that can be scaled up. So the idea isn't to reiterate and change too many of the projects on a recurring basis, but it is there to, to look at a template that can be reused. So discussions around buffer stocks, around schedules, around alternative suppliers, these are common questions which can be challenging for some small companies, some small technology companies, but they form part of a narrative that we need to understand. It was good to hear Paul's presentation earlier because uh, when we talk about deployability, the knock-on implications of what technology does in terms of other assets and other parts of projects, that's a key discussion, a key discussion for us very early into projects. What are those knock-on implications? And they're not always obvious in terms of they may reduce the cost, but do they change procedures? Does it have a knock-on impact in terms of training for offshore crew from handling through installation, through inspection, through recovery? The implications are not always as straightforward as, as they seem. So it's really good that people uh, like Paul uh, are starting to think about what they are and to build that into the early discussion so that when we start to think and get involved in evaluation of designs uh, and design strategy uh, and process, uh, we can take that into account. Because what we try to avoid to do is discounting uh, opportunities uh, for technology, uh, or for deployment of technology too early in the process. But we need to have this confidence to do that. And that leads into, into the third one, which is design isolation. Uh, and again, compliments to Paul and to others who are starting to think about what they are doing, what impact it has on the floating structure design in itself, other parts of the mooring system, into the interaction with the tower, and the potential interaction all the way up in terms of the motion characteristics of the turbine and the blades. Because it is a fully integrated system. Uh, it's, what appear to be small changes at one area can have some quite dramatic impacts elsewhere. Uh, and we have to think about it in terms of a 25 year design life. So a small change can easily be dismissed as saying, well, it's not really changing the characteristics a lot. But if it changes our view in terms of the integrity management process uh, and our level of confidence on whether it will last 25 years, that's a big change. So the direct implications, good and bad, we need to know, and we need to know them early. Um, and we need to know the indirect implications in terms of cranes, handling, procedures, logistics. So it's a, because of the 
embryonic nature and the fact that we don't have this installed base that we can use as a reference point, uh, we almost have to go much wider than we would um, historically within oil and gas. Uh, and to come back to my last point in terms of dependability, uh, and again, this cuts across aspects around the design, around deployability and deliverability. Uh, we have to think beyond the design code because there isn't, there's a degree of confidence from a technical point of view, but we have to think about that 25 year life cycle and the potential performance. And what's the supportive data for that? And particularly when we start to think about on a scaled supply chain uh, basis. Uh, so these are very practical things that we go through. Um, so we work closely with the, the detailed engineers. We work very closely with the, uh, with the project teams. But these are constant questions that we come up in terms of technology uh, and where's the challenge. And a lot of it do feed into risk, um, which is great to hear uh, Jakarta talking about what ri risk actually means to them. Uh, and the fact they're still learning and evolving and developing. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so just to, to, to finish things up from us, uh, so we are technology agnostic and we're actually really supportive. Um, I said before, we've got a lot of experience, a lot of gray hair between us. Uh, we also get a lot of excitement around the offshore industry generally uh, and around technology. Uh, we've all had our fair share of frustration at things taking longer to get into the into the market and be deployed and so we're keen to do it but we have to be cognizant uh, of some of these challenges uh, and so we feed that back where we can so if we look at it today less than one percent of the current planned number of units are currently operational and have a short operational life uh, and there's very little public discourse on what lessons have been learned to date for a whole variety of reasons some practical some confidential some commercial uh, but we don't have a lot of history to play with we also have to bear in mind a lot of the development teams are of mixed operational experience and they're under immense practical pressures in terms of the growth that they're going through as teams as companies and then we also have a finance and insurance insurance sector that i've used the word wary they're not against it, but we have to put it in context. Um, the risk profile has to offer a degree of comfort in many areas and potentially some areas that have higher hurdles today to cross. And then lastly, the supply chain stress. So there's wide discussions around specific challenges, whether they be on more in equipment, whether they be on steel, whether they be certain aspects that that impact floating wind, but we've got wider stress across fixed wind, we've got it across the offshore industry, and we've got wider supply chain stress, if I can get the word out correctly, across industry generally. Um, so the practical, logistical, financial implications of that are, a, are actually really challenging at the moment. So it's not just can I get a particular component, can I get a certain type of vessel, is what am I looking at in terms of delivery times against historical benchmarks? Unfortunately, we've got too complacent in many areas, in particular sub areas of just in time delivery or even uh, days delivery from parts of Asia to, to Europe. Uh, whereas now we need to, to look at weeks, in some cases months, uh, and you have to factor that in. So, Key message from uh, from me um, is really I'd like to see a bit more time and effort and support put into the process of delivering technology alongside developing technology. I think the last couple of years have been really exciting in terms of some of the technology that's been developed, but I now want, I'd like to, to see that conversation evolve into how we actually deliver that technology. Because what I don't want to see is some of the unique growth and development opportunities we've got for new technology be bypassed, um, as many ideas in other sectors have, just because they couldn't deliver alongside develop. Uh, and that's me. Thank you very much for your time. Now we have approximately 15 minutes for the Q&A session. We'll see a few questions, so maybe we'll start with the more general one. 
uh, what what are the current and most pressing technological uh, challenges in the offshore wind industry uh, from your view? Maybe we'll start with uh, Paul first, then Chucky, and then Will. Um, okay, I, I'm obviously biased. Uh, I think mooring is, is, is a very key one, g given the area of our technology. Um, I, I very much agree with a, a lot of what, what, what my co-presenters have said. I think a lot of people have underestimated the the, the risks uh, around getting insurability around new technology, and that's going to be a big, big problem. We, we see scenarios where, where where we hear, oh, yeah, you can get it certified, but, but will the insurers cover it? Uh, and and it's it's very important to get early with them. And I, I totally very much agree with, with with Will that you've got to be able to deliver. And that's our key focus at the moment uh, over the last year or so. That it, it's great to tell people we can deliver these products. They need to see it. They need to see the factory there that can deliver the product at the volume they need when they need it. Um, yes, there's a long lead time be, between when somebody uh, that completes a financial close on a project and the actual delivery. But we're not going to get an order for, for product in 2024 if somebody can't see that we're going to have a factory ready to deliver it uh, at least half a year, if not a year, before they actually need the product delivered to them. So, so there is that little bit of chicken and egg uh, for, for new technologies in this space to ensure that um, you've got plenty of time to, to overcome any of the, I suppose, uh, startup uh, hiccups and delays you might have. Uh, supply chain, as I said, uh, from, from what Will's already said, again, critical. One of the key things our, our target customers have, have ensured or demanded that we, we ensure them on is that the, the volumes of polymer we're using and our supply chain is totally secure right up to the 2030, 2031, 2022 sort of time scales in terms of the, the amount of product we need to deliver in the market. So a single factory from, uh, from us can actually deliver enough product for about one gigawatt worth of farms per year. So it's critical for us to be able to deliver at that scale and give the customers confidence. So, so for us, that's, I suppose, what we see as a key technical challenge. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, so um, I am in, in insurer, so um, this question is quite um, difficult, difficult for me to answer. Um, but yes, I think that um, new technologies um, coming into the industry, and um, I think this is very, important uh, for the industry to grow but at, at the same time as paul was uh, mentioning um insurers are very have to be very conservative to new technologies uh, how, we don't know how the risk can occur um, we, um and well it is our kind of insurers kind of characteristics that we see uh, we insure um, we price the insurance from what has actually occurred from the last the track we see the track records rather than um, track record. So it's not our thing to um, ensure the R&D kind of risks. So um, as Paul said, it, I think it, it is um, important to be that thing to be delivered actually. And so for that, for insurers to know what kind of technology is coming, what actually is coming in and what kind of things that can happen and the importance of the transparency that uh, how those information should be shared to the insurance company for us to be more confident for giving um or providing insurance and um allocating the risk between the insurance and technologies and the project owner so um yeah th this yes I, I i said a lot but um yes the transparency um in the transparent um information will be much in, um, appreciated to the insurance um industry um for new technologies okay Great. Thank you, Jackie. <clears throat> okay. Uh, just to add to that, I think I would like to see us almost try and accelerate how we can get down to a relatively small number of key foundation designs. Um, there are parallels um, in the late 90s in oil and gas. There was at one point uh, in the mid 90s around about 40 or 50 different floating foundation, floating platform designs. By the time we got to 2003, we were really down to a core um, set of four or five with some slight variations. Um, the sooner we can get down to a single digit set of key designs that most people are comfortable that we can at least put an envelope around in terms of what it requires in terms of mooring, what it requires in terms of volumes and a mix of concrete, steel, and other components. 
I think the faster we can help the rest of the supply chain match what needs to be delivered um, and conversely then start to de-risk um, a whole wide variety of different elements that go into a, a, a holistic project. So I'm not against even more designs coming out and I think I'm, last week I noticed another two so-called new designs coming out for floating, uh, floating platforms. Um, not against that, but I think the sooner we can get to a, a core number that we can then get all get behind. I, I think the, the faster the industry will then move into a proper uh, expansive industrial stage. Thank you, Will. Thank you very much. Okay, next question is um, for Paul. Paul, is there any practical application of this latest mooring system which was presented today, spring system? Um, well, we, we have deployments at the moment in the agriculture industry um, off the coast of Ireland where, where we're, we're actually demonstrating that, that these sort of um, components allow you to take existing aquaculture cages and move them to more exposed environments without increasing the loads on those cages. And that, that's quite important, obviously, for, for the salmon industry in particular, for example, in Norway and Scotland and Ireland. Uh, Europe has a massive um, uh, security of supply on, on, its, on its aquaculture industry. It imports about 16 billion uh, euros a year, I believe, in, in, in seafood. So, so it's a big, big challenge. And, and that's because it's a smaller size component for us. That, I suppose, the first market that we've been able to, to deploy in and, and actually get product out there for long periods of time uh, as part of demonstration. So later this year, we should be rolling out our first full farm of, of, of product in the aquaculture industry. Uh, in terms of the, the large FWT scale, as I said, our, our demonstrator that this year will, will be the first sort of a mega newton load component that we'll be delivering. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then, um, Chuck, the next question is to you. Um, as an insurer, so what do you see as the most important risk for floating offshore wind in Japan? Uh, floating offshore wind in Japan, um, I think um, it would be um, how, well, uh, as the, as mentioned in the slides, I think it's um, it's really same with the fixed off, uh, or as the, um, um, as a whole. I think uh, we have to know what kind of um, exposure that, what kind of NACA exposure that we'll have, how, how, it, how the wind turbines and all of the uh, moorings and floaters can bear to that NACA exposure. We have to look into that. Uh, and we have to look into the supply chain, of course. Um, it's it, it, we do think that the um, property damage that we, property damage is what what we have to prevent, but we have to prevent the um, long the down times and the lead times that can happen. Um, of course, it's um, important for the project um, project side, and it, it is important for the insurance aspect as well. So. Um, yeah, I think developing the supply chain, um, which um, for the for the Japanese offshore wind market and NACAT and well, yeah, um, this is um, exactly the same as the slide that I shown, but um, the contract, the experience of the contractors um, installing and laying and um, making the project, um, and also of course the experience of the project owners as well is very important. So I think um, it's still in an immature stage and we it's it, it's really um, difficult to see what kind of risk there is um, at this moment. So um, I would say those three points will be the same um, for the floating as well. Okay, Jake, thank you very much. Uh, next question to Will. Um, Will, what's your view of the floating wind, wind commercial projects 200 uh, megawatt plus? When will the first project be online? Still a lot of talks uh, at the moment and not real projects yet. So that's the, that's, uh, the question to you. It, it's a very um, it's a difficult question in terms of timing. Um, at a practical level, I guess we would actually quite like to see some of the projects that are aimed at 100, um, 200 and 300 actually upscaled and potentially looked at phases. Uh, because in some areas it might actually be easier to think of a larger project than a small project from a supply chain perspective. 
in terms of volumes, in terms of uh, phasing of work so that ports and facilities, for example, can think beyond just one project. They can think about phases of projects uh, and then support that with required investment. Uh, we're finding in a number of areas that some of the smaller projects don't quite generate enough return through the supply chain to support some of the investment that potentially is required for larger projects. So we have some, some real interesting conundrums going on. Um, we are still quite a long way uh, from having 200 or 300 plus projects in the water, um, and quite a long way means years. Uh, but there are opportunities to accelerate that. Uh, but the next 12 months will be quite pivotal in terms of whether those opportunities are grasped or whether we get the classic offshore project delay and things just move to the right. So we could be looking at some substantive projects in the water and operational early as 27, 28. But there's also a significant risk that what's planned for 27, 28 ends up as being 30, 31, 32. Uh, and the next 12, 12, 18 months will be quite pivotal um, to how that plays uh, plays out. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you very much for your answers. We, so I guess uh, that brings us to the end of this webinar, unfortunately. But we see um, WFO present next month with the webinar, Development Challenges. So And uh, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, thank you for presenting, uh, Chucky, Will, and Paul, and uh, all uh, the best. Have a great day.